Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, welcome to our webinar. Today, we're going to be uh, talking with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services about boosting modern, uh, modern data exchange uh, using Rhapsody. And uh, we have a very brief agenda uh, for you. Uh, we're going to take it chronologically. Um, after we do some uh, logistics and introductions, we'll talk about where we're coming from. Uh, what did data exchange look like in the past? What are we doing today in the present? And where will we be going in the future? Uh, so that's uh, the, the sketch of uh, what the uh, outline looks like. Um, a few logistical points. Uh, first of all, uh, everyone on the webinar will be on mute, uh, so we won't get any crosstalk or background noise. Um, but if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, please put them into the chat or the questions section, and uh, we'll address them uh, in real time during the during the webinar. And um, and if we can't get to them, then we will definitely follow up with you. Uh, we'll send out a recording of the of the webinar uh, within 24 hours after it wraps up, and so uh, everybody should be able to uh, to have that recording for them uh, uh, in your inbox tomorrow. Uh, so, without uh, any uh, further uh, further miscellany, uh, I'll go ahead and introduce myself, and then pass it over to our other speakers. Um, my name is Drew Ivan. I'm the Chief Strategy and Product Officer at Rhapsody. Um, I've been with the company a long time, uh, all the way back to its predecessor company. I started working with the Rhapsody tool in 2008. And so uh, I've, I've seen a lot of the progress we've made. Um, and you know, one of the first things I did when I, when I joined uh, was start working with our public health customers. So my experience and my affinity for the, the public health side of the business goes, goes back quite a long ways. Um, but I'll turn it over to our special guest, uh, Jeff, to uh, introduce himself, and then we'll move on to Allison. Thank you, Drew. I'm Jeff Duncan. I'm the director of the Michigan Division for Vital Records and Health Statistics. Um, my division includes the vital statistic registries, including birth certificates, death certificates, and also the, the state cancer registry and the birth defects registry. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I'm Allison Crabtree. I am the Client Support Manager for the Rhapsody Integration Engine and RAS team. Um, previous to this, I spent a bunch of years in middleware software development, database engines, gateways, uh, replication, ODBC, and JDBC drivers. And then I, uh, uh, I morphed into a project and program manager for large IT uh, government system modernization and then stepped in over at the Colorado Department of Public Health for, during the COVID crisis to help with some of the technology gaps, which is where I learned the Rhapsody engine and uh, got to see the, um, the public health, the value of public health at work right in the midst of when we needed it most. Um, Drew, I'll hand it back to you. Yep, thanks, Allison. Um, so, it, my part of the agenda is to talk about the past. And so I did a little bit of research on vital records in public health. And what I found is two interesting things. One is that um, the, the practice of tracking births and deaths goes back a long way. Um, and this makes perfect sense, right? Governments need to keep track of their citizens uh, through censuses and through, uh, through, through understanding uh, who lives within their borders. Uh, so, of course, it's one of the first things that, that anyone tracked. Um, uh, so that, that's one interesting thing. But the second interesting thing is uh, that vital records, even though they were originally generated for political purposes, turned out to be one of the first first places that uh, that that uh, first data sources for public health. Uh, so the the tie between vital records and public health goes back a long way. And um, one of the, the interesting uh, facts I found was that uh, back in 1592 um, in England, they were tracking uh, mortality, they were tracking deaths, um, not just by number or by uh, geography, but by cause of death. And you can see some of the causes of death um, uh, that were going on back then were things like lethargy and king's evil. Uh, not even sure uh, what some of those mean, uh, but uh, but the the practice of tracking uh, deaths and causes of death goes back uh, that far and probably further. 
uh, the other thing uh, that uh, that I've called out here is that um, these uh, these bills of mortality, as they were called, uh, were compiled and then they were distributed as a subscription. So people paid money to uh, to subscribe to these uh, death records. Um, so the tie between um, uh, some sort of uh, uh, compensation for uh, for compiling these records also goes back a long way in history. Um, on the next slide, we'll fast forward to the 1800s, sort of the, the 100 years between uh, 1850 and 1950. Uh, this is where a lot of progress was made, uh, starting with none other than Florence Nightingale. She did a lot for, for health care, and one of the things she did was suggest that we should start categorizing uh, hospitalizations so that we could do some statistical um, analysis, some descriptive statistics on what are the reasons that people, people are in the hospital. And slowly over time, that morphed into the international classification of diseases, the ICD codes that we all know and love. And by 1949, ICD-6 was, uh, was codified. Uh, we're up to ICD-10 today, and in some places even beyond that. Um, but ICD-6 was initially uh, designed for studying mortality. So uh, this sort of takes the, the practice of vital records to the next level. Um, not only are we tracking uh, individual deaths and causes of deaths, but we're uh, codifying them uh, to make it easier to compile statistics. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the ICD-10 codes have been uh, with us for a long time, and they were also driven out of the practice of, of vital records. Uh, so just a couple more slides. On the next one, uh, we're showing, uh, you know, we, we went from uh, about 1600 to the 1800s to um, pretty much the present day. These these are diagrams from 2018 of the, the process flows uh, for registering a birth uh, on the left and registering a death on the right. And you can see that there's a lot of steps. There's a lot of participants involved. And the green arrows show places where uh, money or reimbursements flow. So um, the, the, the whole, the whole uh, business of getting born and dying uh, generates quite a lot of administrative overhead for different, uh, different departments. But all of that data that's generated can turn into a great source of raw material for public health. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, one last uh, slide um, to talk about uh, the, the sort of the state of the art. Um, and this goes a little uh, outside of, of public health, but um, as many of us recall, starting in 2008, there was a, a American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, part of which triggered the meaningful use uh, rules. And the, the purpose of meaningful use was to drive clinicians, doctors and, and providers uh, towards storing their healthcare records electronically. And, uh, and so quite a lot of funding went toward um, uh, motivating um, uh, doctors to, to move to electronic health records. And you can see that it, it had the desired effect. We went from about 20% adoption before meaningful use to up to 90% adoption uh, after the meaningful use program, and it still stays there today. So um, uh, the, the healthcare system uh, took a long time to adopt uh, electronic uh, medical records, but once it did, um, you know, I think we needed that um, that that uh, nudge from from the government um, to to get widespread adoption. Once we did, I think now we have a good fundamental electronic infrastructure for recording healthcare data. Uh, part of what we want to talk about today is that even though that funding helped on the provider side to adopt and track um, data electronically, there wasn't the similar investment on the public health side to receive all of those, um, uh, all of that electronic data. Uh, that came quite a bit later um, as part of the pandemic, and so we'll we'll track some of that uh, that funding and some of the the results of that funding uh, as we dive into uh, stop talking about the past and start talking about the present. Um, so that's I think where uh, where my section leaves off, and uh, we'll bring in Jeff to start talking about uh, kind of what's going on in Michigan. Uh, what are some of the the uh, the key programs that are going on today, and what are some of the um, some of the opportunities that we're taking advantage of. Great, thanks, Joe. Um, you know, I know when I was in, in public health in Colorado, and I was seeing, I was watching the ELR data flow. Um, we had all sorts of data quality gaps and automation gaps. Uh, we had non-clinical reporters trying to give us results. We had inconsistent coding. 
we had um, patient self misrepresentation and leading to like we didn't have enough identifiers to really even deterministically merge those lab results into case management systems. It got really, really hard to answer the questions that were that the public most wanted to know and our decision makers as well. And and I'm curious, Jeff, for you, you know, what was it like for uh, for vital records? You know, what were some of the kinds of data that you were being asked to provide, and what were some of the challenges around providing that data? Um, thanks, Allison, and thanks, Drew, for the introduction. Yeah. Um, the meaningful use brought this technical infrastructure, but at the start of the pandemic, vital records really wasn't positioned to code deaths quickly and accurately. You mentioned ICD-10 coding. So in the pandemic, when it first started, there were not ICD-10 codes for COVID-19. There, there were codes developed by the World Health Organization as the uh, the, the pandemic rolled out U uh, zero seven point one and point two, and uh, the process we that states use most states use to code those deaths is to send the cause of death literals. It's what physicians write on death certificates. We send those to the National Center for Health Statistics in batches, and we get codes back. And Physicians write free text, they, and they write COVID-19 as just one example in hundreds of different ways. They even misspell COVID, C-O-V-D-I. I saw that more than once. Um, so the data have to be co coded in order for us to provide accurate statistics. And so as the pan pandemic rolled out, and people were dying, Michigan was one of the early spots where a, a large proportion of, of residents were dying early in the pandemic and leaders and decision makers want to know where are the deaths happening? Uh, who are they happening to? What are their characteristics? Are they old? Are they young? What is their racial background? Um, do they have comorbidities? They want to know all of that. Things that are on death certificates, but death certificates just weren't timely enough. It took us up to a couple weeks to get those codes back from NCHS at the start of the pandemic, again, because of this batch process and the requirement that someone in a state vital records office click a button and produce a file and upload it into some transfer portal like SAMS or the other that uh, NCHS or CDC uses and then get a file back. And so th there's a lot of overhead, a lot of manual work in the process and it was just too slow for information for a, a pandemic like COVID that moved very quickly. That's pretty insightful. Thank you, Jeff. And so we're looking today at, um, at a fairly sizable funding to modernize the vital statistics system. And um, I am curious from your perspective, Kind of what are you hoping can come from this project and and uh, you know where are you hoping to take it? Well, so I, we can go back to to Drew's introduction and meaningful use, and it's really relevant here because and and even vital records over history, we went from a, a line in a, a ledger in a book to a piece of paper stored in a book. And around 2000, as, as internet technology evolved, every state developed these electronic systems to get births and deaths, these web-based systems to allow hospitals and doctors to enter the information that goes on birth and death certificates. Um, around 2010, meaningful use came out and health departments, um, the public health use cases that were authorized for meaningful use uh, Incentive dollars included things like immunization registries and electronic lab reporting, but they didn't include vital statistics or death reporting, for example. Even though we tried, and, and uh, for years, I worked with teams from CDC and from other states to develop HL7 version two standards to exchange data with the National Center for Health Statistics for coding and among states and between hospitals. 
Um, we did those version two messages. Uh, we, we transitioned to CCDAs and the, the standards around those. I was telling Drew before we started, I spent about 10 years going to connectathons in Chicago and then in Cleveland and, and demonstrating the potential of this technology. But we never really got anywhere until COVID happened. And, and, and COVID, uh, was sort of the, the stimulus that the government, the federal government needed to get the funding to bring vital records into the interoperable age. And so it was a result of COVID that we got the CARES Act of 2020 and the National Vital Statistics System got $77 million, which turned out to be 1.35 million to 57 vital statistics jurisdictions to develop fire interoperability for coding ICD-10 causes of death. So instead of batch processes, instead of manual file uploads and downloads, a fire-based API that would return a code in near real time for a death certificate. That, that's the kind of timeliness we need to fight a, a 21st century pandemic. And so at, at the, uh, Gosh, it's, it's probably been about 18 months ago or more when that funding was released and states were faced with not only trying to implement a standard, uh, a record-based standard, but a fire standard, which most people were not familiar with at the time, um, has had not really been tested. Um, fire was seeing some use, but... Uh, Still, in a lot of cases, not a lot of adoption, especially not in public health. It's interesting. We, I mean, we had HL7. It's tried and true. We could have gone that route. You have done a lot of the legwork for the CCDA, um, and uh, and and here we are looking at fire. And I'm wondering how you see fire is different from some of these other solutions, and and what are some of the advantages. So version two, the, the uh, uh, message standard really would have worked. And some of the problems we encounter with version two and not just in, in that use case, but when in every use case is it, it's, it was kind of a loose standard and people ended up taking workarounds to get data out of legacy systems. And so the more workarounds you do to a standard, the less standard it becomes. And on a scale nationwide, I think there were some fears, definitely that uh, we would see a lot of that happening and it would be a kind of a difficult ship to keep afloat on HL7 version two. Um, the CCDA standard, a, a lot tighter standard, the reference implementation model, the, the RIM really defined everything almost um, too well. Um, because the, the CCDA, I, I like to think of it, it was more of an all or nothing approach. You, you got everything or you got nothing and getting everything was almost a bridge too far. We, we did a lot of testing and connectathons, like I said, we, we could test a few little causes of death, but no one was really jumping at the bit either from health departments or on the, the electronic health record side to say we wanted to do this and certainly there were no customers I think demanding it so fire came along why is fire better well it there's a couple of things about fire that this API approach that the fire is built on I think readily uh, adapts itself to this workflow that we have of a um, a per record uh, you know a record and a response through an API uh, and the information model in FIRE based on resources. Again, it's not as rigid as the, the RIM was in the CCDA world, much more flexible for use cases like sending deaths to the National Center for Health Statistics as opposed to sending deaths to your neighboring state uh, for their residents that died. The information needs are slightly different, and so you can adapt implementation guides to meet those different needs with without 
developing entire new standards. And so in a lot of ways, I think that's the, the advantage that FHIR brings to this type of exchange. That's great. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, you, um, you know, you, you, you've got $1.35 million. I'm curious with all that money to burn, um, how you made some, made your decisions about what your tech stack should look like. So, yeah, there, there were a couple of ways we talked about it. As I mentioned, states, every state now, I think has this electronic death system. It's a web-based system that and funeral directors and everyone can log into medical examiners but um, a th there's a few vendors in the space and you can go to the vendor and have a, a fire API built um, or you can build what's called a fire facade or you can use something that that we already have 1.35 million sounds like a lot of money in public health but and it is a lot of money in public health. It's the most money anyone's ever given me in 25 years <laughs> that I didn't have to like do a lot of work for. They just said, here you go. Here's what we want you to do with it. And that's never happened before, at least not on that scale. So, but it goes quickly. By the time you do implementations and hosting and testing, and you have vendors to deal with and state IT agencies and work processes, it, the money goes quickly. So we were looking at a way to do it quickly and inexpensively. And Michigan Department of Health, as I think nearly every other public health department in the country, had Rhapsody. And they had the Rhapsody interface engine or integration engine because of uh, meaningful use largely and even predating meaningful use. A lot of health departments, I was in Utah in 2010, and prior to that, immunization registries were getting um, V2 messages from hospitals. Um, meaningful use really spurred the adoption of electronic case reporting, of syndromic surveillance, of a lot of these other public health use cases that led health departments to invest in Rhapsody as an integration engine, as a means of getting these HL7 version two and version three uh, CCDA messages um, and bringing them into legacy systems. So it, the, the beauty of it is it takes that, whatever that standard is coming in and you can develop the, the flow paths and transform that data and put it to, into the systems where it needs to go. And you can put it in lots of different systems, which is what happens in public health. Um, so we had Rhapsody. No one had used Fire, though. To my knowledge, I don't know that anyone in public health had really used Fire in Rhapsody. So we had some discussions with with our vendor Alterum, who does our our interface um, interoperability work, about using Rhapsody in this role. Would it work? Um, what were the pluses and minuses? And, and, and we really settled on the fact that Rhapsody would be the fastest way to get a solution in place and also the least expensive to get a solution in place. And so that's what we settled on. At the same time, we, we um, with that 77 million, the National Center for Health Statistics uh, created what they called a community of uh, Oh, a, a community of implementation community. And there were monthly meetings and everyone implementers from all around the country would get on these monthly meetings and talk about how they were going to meet the challenge of integrating their death certificates using fire. And on one of those meetings, I presented Michigan's plans and several other states, it turns out, were also looking at using Rhapsody uh, Virginia, I think, and Washington, and a couple others, and some other states were interested in in seeing what that might look like if if they could use Rhapsody. It turns out they could, and so several other states now are are pursuing the Rhapsody solution for sending fire to and from NCHS because uh, the ease. It's something they already own, 
it's already in house. They have the product. They may not have the the people they need, the interface engineers to build a fire interface, but they can get them. That skill is out there. They have the product. So the time to, to getting an interface in place is much quicker. It can integrate with any legacy EDRS, um, depending on the, the database, you, you can adapt them all. So, um, so for those reasons, a lot of states have chosen to use uh, Rapsty for this use case and also for other uh, public health use cases. And uh, I just want Community to revisit practice. It's on the, okay. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Jeff. Community of practice is on the slide. I, I was trying to remember what that was, community of practice. Exactly. And you mentioned they, the NCHS also holds technical office hours and, um, and you were key. Uh, not only in the, the, you obviously have been on the cutting edge for a long time, working with CCDA, now you're you're um, implementing FIRE and you are one of the key members of this RAPSD working group. And I would just want to call it out here because I know some of the folks in our audience might be wondering how they can do what you have accomplished and, um, and to know that there's this resource out there of, of folks who have who have uh, tread the path already is, is extremely valuable. Yeah, so we, we have a, a subgroup of that community of practice, a Rhapsody working group, and it was for all states that are either using Rhapsody or interested in using Rhapsody for this or any other public health use case. So we, we had some other states that, that weren't going to use Rhapsody for the NCHS use case, but they want to integrate their death system with their state surveillance system using fire and they're looking at rhapsody to do that and uh to be honest we're looking at rhapsody to to accomplish that in michigan as well so um we'll have some discussions about that use case so we meet once a month and it's a teams meeting and it's organized by me and if someone wants to participate they can send me an email i i think at the end of this my email address will be available um, really the doors are open to all uh, public health rhapsody implementation um, to come and learn we talk about uh, the the workflows the the routes that we develop through rhapsody some of the testing that we do we've shared test cases among states participating so that we can all um, help each other solve this problem together. And, and you were kind enough to share with me um, one of your Rhapsody routes. And, uh, and I, I, I'm sure this is an eye chart for, for most of the folks in our audience, but, uh, but uh, it sounds like this is the kind of information that, that you guys can talk about in this Rhapsody working group, how you actually solved some of these problems. Exactly, it gets into the details and I, I can't see the specifics on my screen, but uh, I was telling Allison before we started today that like any project on its surface, you think, okay, sending ICD-10 codes to NCHS or sending data to NCHS, and getting codes back, that's pretty easy, right? Send, receive. But when you start digging into the requirements, it's when all of the things come out that all of the gotchas that you have to put into a production uh, exchange, a production interface, you have to account for everything. And so what you see on the screen is just one of the routes and it accounts for all of the different scenarios that were anticipated and that we, that we talked through in our group and in our development uh, daily stand-ups and things like that that we conducted um, it's complicated information technology in healthcare and public health is complicated um, it helps when you have a group of peers in other jurisdictions that are doing the same thing because you can share some of those challenges and ideas and ultimately everyone's route may not look the same because their needs may be slightly different but again, we can share those. Um, and the other thing I, I will point out is that uh, I, I mentioned three different routes. There, there's sort of a push and a pull. We push 
those cause of death literals and the death certificate to the National Center for Health Statistics. And then there's a poll that pulls those ICD-10 codes back. So they don't push those back to us. So a couple different kinds of fire transactions going on there. And what were some of the challenges that you ran into? I mean, you're an early adopter in the, on this, this new protocol. So uh, one of the biggest challenges I think is that the, the implementation guide, the fire implementation guide was not fully settled when everyone started this. And, and if you don't have a solid implementation guide, we've learned, you really don't have a standard because it changes. And then changes to the implementation guide change things in this route here that you're seeing and, and, and your thought processes. There's a lot of changes that snowball from a simple change to the implementation guide. So we learned that. Uh, we learned, I, I think, at big picture level that, uh, and we learned that every project we do, like I said, things are always much more complicated than they, than you think they're going to be when you start. Um, there have been delays, um, mostly because of implementation guide issues. Um, we're starting to work through those now. Um, Michigan stands to be the fourth state to go into production with the National Center for Health Statistics. I was told uh, maybe a week ago, two weeks ago, that NCHS wants to get 12 states into production by the end of the year. And of course, that anticipates the NCHS is at their desks next week, which is up in the air. So <laughs> maybe if the government keeps open, we, we can make that deadline. And, and I think a, a key thing for you, for your progress, is you uh, let me know that you've already gone through that pre-certification process with NCHS and you're starting your certification process now. Um, were there any surprises when you went through that, that those processes? No real huge surprises. The, the pre-certification, it, it brings out minor details that uh, you miss in the implementation guide and, and you run through a variety of tests meant to test every conceivable um, you know, scenario that this may see in production and, and to look at those results and to make sure that everything is working as planned. And no big, no big surprises, some some minor details to work out, but that's to be expected, I think, in any type of project like this. That's great. Every system that we have, you know, they're, they are their own single source of truth for their particular um, domain. And yet we've got patients that live in each of these different systems. And I'm sure that you have to uh, struggle, you have struggled with that as well. So, you know, how are you solving the patient matching problem, or, or are you? So we are in Michigan. We have an enterprise master person index that is tied to the the uh, Medicaid data warehouse. So, the Medicaid in the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services has a, a data warehouse that gets data from most big production systems in the in the health and human services department and they maintain an MPI from those systems. It can be a little difficult to get data out of and to use operationally. Uh, so what's intriguing to me and what we've discussed with Rhapsody is the, the ability to extract patient matching information as data flows through Rhapsody in or out and to link them in a cloud-based EMPI that, that could provide much more timely patient matching. Again, the data warehouse is updated at some frequency, um, be it daily or weekly. Um, so it's, it's more of a back-end match. And there really aren't any tools for us to go in and to assess the quality of matches or to that maybe resolve near matches or if there are any false positive matches to, to disambiguate ones that should have matched. So um, that's why we're looking at, at 
capturing data that goes in and goes out of Rhapsody, um, death events coming in or going out uh, during COVID-19, we manually matched in Michigan and probably a lot of other health departments. Once a week, I would get a file from our disease surveillance system and I would run a manual matching algorithm using our software and I would produce a match and I would email it back to the surveillance system in a CSV file, which then they would upload. And, you know, again, it's a delay in the process that someone has to do. And if I couldn't do it on the day that I got it, I, I did it the next day. It just had to wait, right? And public health can't wait and nor should it have to. I mean, those things can be done in real time as the data flow in and out. And, and, I will also mention that that we recently were funded another roughly $1.3 million to send births to the National Center for Health Statistics using a FIRE API. And that deadline is sometime in 2027. So this, what we're working on now will hopefully be in our rearview mirror and will be operational and we'll have learned a lot from it, but the opportunity to also send birth data out through Rhapsody and to, to link births and deaths in the integration engine instead of in a back-end data warehouse has a, a, an operational appeal to me that I want to, to look into further to see if we can make use of that. Uh, this, this, what you're describing sounds very familiar. We, we had our own uh, deterministic matching algorithm, uh, did a lot of manual matching and um and also the the dilemma in government of you want to make good use of tax pay, taxpayer dollars and so it makes a lot of sense to try to solve something at an enterprise level but then mm -hmm. that also means you've got multiple stakeholders and um and then you become very dependent upon everybody's ability to be agile and also have some common requirements uh, like around data quality for example and so there's that trade-off of, um, of wanting your own system, needing to be able to address your own immediate needs, and then also wanting to, to spread the cost across. Um, you did mention that Rhapsody, the company, we've also got our own Enterprise Master Patient Index um, solution, and um, we are working to make the integration between those two products, the integration engine and our EMPI, as seamless as possible for, for those folks who do want to use both of them in their data flow. And um, and I, I, I thank you for considering this. <laughs> See, we have I, a couple of yeah. questions uh, on EMPI. So uh, before we move on, maybe I'll just inject them here. Yeah. Um, the first one uh, is uh, pretty specific. It's uh, the question is, what's the computational load for EMPI matching uh, data in transit? I don't know, Jeff, if you have a uh, an idea of of the turnaround time for uh, conducting a patient match on data in flight. I don't, because we've not done it yet. Like I said, most of ours is in a data warehouse uh, after the fact. Yeah. Um, I, I have to think, though, that in, in a cloud-based system, you probably, I don't know, get what you pay for, I guess. Um, if you give it more resources, you can probably get pretty responsive matching. Yeah. So certainly with the Rhapsody EMPI, it's the common case to um, make an API call to the EMPI as the data is moving through a Rhapsody route. So it's, it's intended to be used in real time. Um, where you get into trouble is if there's not a clear match um and and a human has to intervene that goes to a work queue so um so it, it may be an asynchronous process but for for definite matches or for definite non-matches uh in other words it's a it's a definitely a new patient that goes quite quickly uh the other question about uh patient matching is around legal issues with sharing um in this case vital records with other programs like disease surveillance but i know that um a lot of the programs in public health are set up by state laws, which uh, which put guardrails around how that data can be used and whether it can be shared. Do you, do you see that 
uh, changing at all as, uh, as as states try to take a more enterprise approach, or or are there still those uh, barriers in place? Within health departments, uh, at least the two I've worked for, the in Utah and Michigan, uh, no barriers with sharing within the department, especially identifiers for linking purposes. When you get into sharing identifiers um, with program staff for use cases or with external data partners, then yes, there, there's going to be challenges everywhere. But connecting the dots between a person in an immunization registry or in duplicates in an immunization registry using birth certificate data, I think that's pretty standard practice at, at probably every immunization registry in the country. Um, so for matching and linking purposes, operational purposes, I, I think most states would be pretty permissive for that use within their health departments. Uh, the, the challenges would come in sharing that linked data for purposes. And depending on those purposes, they, they can be worked out often with um, data use agreements and, and things like that, that that safeguard the identities of the people that are involved. And again, that really depends a lot on state laws. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple other questions. Uh, one is about uh, data quality and advice on handling things like uh, missing lab results or wrong link codes uh, with test names um, uh, that they may not apply in vital records, but certainly there there could be data quality issues or or missing data issues in, in vital records. Um, is there, uh, like, how much focus is there on detecting or trying to correct um, that those types of, of uh, data quality issues? And do you see a uh, high level of data quality issues in the data that you're uh, that you're handling? It really depends on the data. So um, we have these electronic systems, like I mentioned. Uh, they do a pretty good job at ensuring that required fields are there for death certificates. So, mm -hmm. but in some cases, uh, the, if it's an ME case, for example, they may not know a birthday or an age or an identity. So that does happen that we get unknown. Uh, cause of death, sometimes unknown or pending, those come from medical examiners and those are all, typically almost always amended um, once final toxicology and investigation results are done. So uh, again, I don't think we see a lot of missing data because our systems require it to register a death certificate and people need that death certificate to accomplish some business and so we, we typically get data whether it's good data or not sometimes is subject to debate in different fields uh, sometimes are, are questionable i know there are data quality issues sometimes with things like race and ethnicity um, marital status um, other check boxes on the death certificate, like ma, uh, whether it's a female, if she was pregnant at the time of birth or something like that, those have known quality issues, but they're not often left blank because of the systems that capture the data. Yeah, and probably if we looked close enough at that flow chart of the, of the death certificate process, uh, we would we would see some of those uh, places where the amendment workflows uh, fall into place. That that's part okay. of the complexity of the process. Yeah. Um, and one final question before we go to the wrap up slide, uh, which kind of leads into it. Maybe Allison can answer this question. Uh, there is a question about uh, the newness of fire. It's uh, it's something that's unfamiliar to a lot of customers. Um, does the Rhapsody team have professional services and or training for uh, for fire and uh, and and what what does that look like? We do have some fire courses on our uh, academy. It is a an online resource that's available to any of our existing customers. Um, I believe the fire and co courses are included with your support and maintenance contract. Um, and uh, we could take a look and see if there's anything any more in depth that's required as an additional fee. Uh, professional services absolutely are available. Uh, they can be contracted on a project basis or on an hourly basis. So if you know you want to do the implementation yourself, but you really need a buddy as a ride along 
uh, for consultation. Uh, you only get charged for the hours that you use. Awesome, thank you. And that's a great lead into our, our, our last slide, which wraps everything up. Um, we like to think of Rhapsody, the engine, but also Rhapsody, the company, as uh, a toolkit of useful functionality for accomplishing your integration needs. So we have the Rhapsody engine, which you know a lot of our, our audience is already familiar with. We have the Enterprise Master Patient Facility. We have um, a code management and, and maintenance facility to promote uh, semantic interoperability. And by combining these capabilities together, you can uh, accomplish pretty much anything you need to uh, with your interoperability tasks. So that includes tying together systems uh, within an organization, such as within the Department of Health. Uh, it could also uh, include tying together systems outside of uh, across organizations. Um, and so moving data from hospitals to public health or from uh, hospitals to insurance companies, uh, we handle all of that. And um, uh, that last question is a great wrap up to, to remind that um, it's not just the technology, but we also have the services and the support to, to back that up and, uh, and make your project a success. Um, so with that, um, I think we'll wrap it up and thank our presenters um, and uh, remind the audience that uh, the recording will be uh, available uh, within 24 hours. You should get an email and you know, feel free to um, review the recording, but also circulate it among your colleagues. Um, and so with that, I think we can sign off. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for sharing. Really appreciate you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.